And here he comes down the stairs to the basement. My new friend, John Peterson joins us. How are you, man? I'm excellent. You know, this is a little like more cozy than I was expecting down here. You know, I mean, I, uh, and then with all the sound rigs and the lights and everything, uh, but you're, you're making the best use of the space, I have to say. Doesn't it seem though, John, like a place where when you and I were teenagers, we would have gotten together and we would have done a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. This is the legend that everybody played in their basement. If you have a nice finished basement, that can be great. If you don't, you know, if there's a lot of water, you know, six inches of standing water, the sump pump doesn't really work. I think it was yeah. more like my childhood. Really, the basement was not where I would have been playing. But. I was going to say, we've had that before. It is not pretty down here, but we made up for it and tried to make the best out of the uh, best that we could out of uh, what, what is that? Uh, lemons and lemonade, right? D d doing enough. that. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive into this. You uh, uh, really set the stage at the beginning of, of game wizards uh, about the, the gaming industry in general and where it, it is. And there's really two different game industries kind of that you point to at the same time. Let's talk about the big game industry, right? The people making Monopoly, that type of thing. Tell me about that game industry first. What was going on in the 60s there? Well, I mean, obviously board games were phenomenally popular. This was the heyday of when Milton Bradley had re-released the Game of Life, right? Which is actually a game that had been around since the Civil War. The original Milton Bradley kind of gave on a checkerboard the path was on the 64 squares of a checkerboard, like Game of Life to like Civil Civil War um, uh, combatants, actually. But like, you know, the Game of Life was big. Obviously, Monopoly was huge. And this, this was a time that Monopoly was nearing like its 40th anniversary, right? I mean, it came out in the 30s. And so by the 60s, this was a game that is selling you know, 2 million copies a year, right? This, everybody has Monopoly sets. Everybody plays Monopoly. Of course, nobody plays it by the rules. Sure, everybody right. Everybody plays by their house rules. But we, um, we actually talked to Mary Pallon. I don't know if you know Mary, who talked through the, the, and it was only when I talked to Mary that I realized if you play it by the rules, it's a much shorter game. It's actually is a swingier game. It's, it's, it's way more fun and it's over in 90 minutes. Right, right. No, I love her book, by the way. Yeah, it's a phenomenal research. The uh, 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 but these companies are making big money, or they're at least making good money. There's a secondary gaming industry you talk about, and a company called Avalon Hill, kind of at the start of that. Tell me about this sub, kind of like the basement of the of the board gaming universe. Sure. So uh, there's a guy named Charles S. Roberts from Maryland who founded the Avalon Hill company in the late 1950s. And, you know, he, he basically, he, he thought he was going to be uh, sent to Korea, right? And he wanted to learn about tactics. He wanted to learn how to be like a better officer and understand combat situations and so on. And so he made this game called Tactics that he self-published originally in 1954. By 1958, he realized it was doing well enough that he could branch out and do a couple other games. So he formed the Avalon Hill Game Company to do that. And, you know, he, he had an early success in a game called Gettysburg which was, you know, done for the anniversary, right, of the, the Battle of Gettysburg. And that, you know, got him a bit of a press windfall. And these were games that would sell, you know, a couple hundred thousand copies if they did quite well, um, probably sub mm. 100,000. But they, they were board games, usually covered with these chits, these little pieces of cardboard. They would be the positions of all of the military units. And there was a set of rules that governed how you would move these units into conflict with one another on a board that, Originally, they were squares, but quickly they became hex maps. They had these hexagonal maps that they started using as of the early 1960s. And when units came into conflict, you would roll a die. And you'd roll this die against a combat resolution table, which was this little table in the rule book. that would say, OK, for this die result, if your odds, like if you have three guys facing one guy, um, your odds are pretty good. And on this, you'll eliminate the one guy, right? And all your three guys will be fine, unless you roll poorly. In which case, your guys might lose, and you might lose two guys, and that one guy is still there that you're trying to get. Um, and and these games formed this subculture, right? By the mid 1960s, there was a real American subculture that was dedicated to these games. That had started to have conventions and put out amateur magazines. They had these clubs. It was a strange, vibrant, um, white middle class youth culture. Yeah, but these, aren't, but, 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 but these aren't the same kids that are playing. You talked about Life in Monopoly, though, John. That These aren't the same people playing those games. I mean, as, as you're intimating, these are really involved, deep strategy games. 
They are. I mean, you know, risk came out at the end of the fifties, right. Kind of on the tail end of this. And yeah. like, you know, you can look at risk and say it's kind of close maybe to what they were doing. Um, but yeah, these were not games like, uh, you know, Candyland, where you just kind of roll the <laughs> dice, you end up where you end up, you know, or shoots and ladders, you know, things like that. These, these are games that were intended to approximate the experience of command in warfare. So one of the one of the big fans of these games is a gentleman in Wisconsin named Gary Gygax. And you start painting this picture at the beginning of Game Wizards about uh, about this uh, Gary Gygax character. Tell me tell me a little bit about, about Gary in the early days and how he kind of began to rise to prominence in this group of people who love these strategy games. So, so Gary um, started playing these games really with Gettysburg. Gettysburg brought a lot of people into the hobby and he played them with his friends. You know, he was a little older maybe than some of the, the kids who connected up with this by the sixties, you know, he was already in his thirties. He had a family, he had a good job. He had a job as an insurance underwriter in Chicago and he commuted from this little vacation town called Lake Geneva uh, where he lived down to Chicago every day on the train. And you know what he did while he sat in that hour plus commute on the train was study these games and write about these games and correspond with people and design variants. And he was obsessed with, okay, can we make these games better? Pretty much everybody who was into these games for real was always thinking about, okay, I could have divide, you know, figured out a better combat resolution system, or I want to transpose this from here to this other battle that I think is interesting. Because almost like story. what you were almost like you were talking about, John, with Monopoly earlier. How we all play Monopoly with these house rules. These guys are playing these complex games and making up their own house rules. They were, and and they would publish them, like I said, in in these uh, they called them fanzines, these amateur magazines that wargaming clubs had, and you know through these fanzines, people shared ideas. It was this kind of vibrant open source community, right? Nobody cared much about intellectual property. Nobody thought any of these like I'm going to do a variant for this nine dollar board game that they'd be able to sell that and make any money, right? This was very much a you know uh, an intellectual comment that these people are participated in. And, and Gary really gravitated to that aspect of the hobby. And uh, he founded clubs around it. He worked with a group that was called the, the War Game Inventors Guild, right? It sounds very, very serious. Um, right. yes. you know, it, it, had, it had kind of like a peer review dimension. People would look at each other's designs and bet them which one's better and even maybe put them out in a semi-commercial, I'll sell this for a buck at a convention, right? This is my version of what you should really do, you know, for the Battle of the Bulge, right? Um, but, but we talk about business and being a good business person. He's this guy playing these games, but but did he never, did, did I read this right in your book that he never graduated from high school? He never graduated from high school. I mean, he took some correspondence classes and he did some night school in Chicago. Uh, he went through the, um, you know, a kind of mutual insurance, like, you know, correspondence course, basically, to get his necessary certifications to work in insurance. But yeah, he, he was a bookish, but unschooled, is the way I put it, right? He's a guy who read a lot, but uh, he was a bit of a rebel, I guess, when he was a teenager. And, you know, and I mean, on a personal note, I mean, his, his father passed away, um, really, in, in his last year at school, right? And it, he, he kind of, dropped out after that he was going to go into the army he wanted to be a marine that didn't work out super well like i said he's he's more bookish than yeah. um you know a, a marine type but so but something it feels like just reading your words that that made up for it a lot and makes up for a lot of um uh, i guess um uh achilles heels that that uh entrepreneurs will have is that he's a great networker like i got this feeling he's a phenomenal networker john he was. I mean, everybody who met him was very impressed by both how gregarious he was, but also just how much time he wanted to spend listening, right? He was somebody, if you're designing games, he wanted to talk to you about, okay, like, let, what are you trying to do? Like, how can we make that better? And, yeah, he uh, was a good, just, he, well, and on that note, not to cut you off, but he, but you wrote, he's also a really good collaborator. Like, instead of sitting in a room alone, like this riffing that you're talking about was really kind of his genius. In some ways, yeah, he did all of his best work working with other people, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, I think, hard for him to uh, get started on these things. And I, I'm kind of the same way. Like, I, I know I write some of my best stuff reacting against stuff I don't like, <laughs> right? Like, you know, and it, 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 I think he, you know, he would see something, he'd be like, oh, man, there's a better way to do that. And like that, that was definitely where he was most productive. 
So uh, uh, he is creating these rules. Is there any market for the for these rules professionally, like there was for Avalon Hill Games or for the the big boys? Is anybody buying this stuff? I mean, not really, right? These are things you might be able to sell 50 copies of if you're lucky for a buck or two. And, you know, I mean, if you had any production value, uh, mostly these are photocopy. Like you have to, when I was talking about the little cardboard chits, you would, you know, glue those to a piece of cardboard, a paper, uh, you know, just a piece of paper they would ship in the game. You'd have to glue that to cardboard, then take an X-Acto knife and cut all the chits out yourself, right? So some some assembly required. Right. Um, but... You know, I remember that's... doing that, by the way, uh, John, I'm old enough to have done that. Like, like, uh, to take out the scissors and, uh, just horrible. Yeah. So, but no, there was no prospect of making any money from this, which is kind of what makes the story of game wizards so interesting because it turns out there was money in, in this, in the most unlikely places. So, but it, but it wasn't a hit right away. So he pairs up with this gentleman, uh, uh, Dave Arneson. Tell me about Arneson. So Arneson was about a decade younger. Um, he was still a college student when they met up. And Gary ran this convention in Lake Geneva that was called the Lake Geneva War Games Convention, or that for short, the Geneva Convention. Or, and then for even shorter, Gen Con. This is a convention that still happens today. Uh, the first when he ran in 68, there were only like 100 people there. Today, like 60 or 70,000 people show up. <laughs> <in this. laughs> um, so it's kind of became a big deal. But at the second Gen Con, he met this guy, Dave Arneson, who is very interested in a kind of miniature wargaming. Now, this is a bit different from the board war games that Avalon Hill sold. These were war games with like little toy soldiers, right? Or that you would play out not on a board, but on a table, maybe even a sand table you use to like sculpt terrain and you put little miniature trees and houses and roads and hills and streams and things like that. That, you know, it was like the, the equivalent of graphics. We think of like computer graphics today. Yeah. Miniature war game is like the graphics of the 60s. And Arneson was super into those and especially naval war games. So he and Gary started collaborating on a set of war games that were based on the great age of sail. It was called Don't Give Up the Ship. And they just kicked around some rule ideas, but eventually this got to a point of maturity where they thought they could publish it as a product, which they did. I was surprised though that Arneson wanted to work with Gygax after this because Gygax and the distributor really stiff him like Arneson's first check bounces, John. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not just his first check. Um, <laughs> like a, a whole bunch of um, promises were made about payment for this. And, but, you know, put this in perspective as well. We're talking about royalties um, that would be paid for this game that are, you know, in the $20 a quarter range, right? This is not a ton of money. Now, that's in some respects even more sad that right. his publisher right. Guiding Games couldn't even cough up like 20 bucks. Right. But that gives you a sense of just how small this hobby was. Yeah. And, and nobody really thought about it like it was going to be a business, right? I mean, you know, Gary talks a lot about, look, the, the real value of this is just, you know, seeing your name in print, the satisfaction of making a game that, that other people think is cool in this little hobby. If you make like a couple bucks, that's just icing on the cake. To your point, uh, uh, when um, TSR is is founder, was it? No, it wasn't when TSR was founded. It was when Dungeons and Dragons, the idea is coming out, and they're licensing Dungeons and Dragons to TSR, their company. You include this whole write up about how either the designers tell me if I get this right. Either the, the designers can buy it back uh, if it flops for whatever the market value is at the time, not to exceed $300. Like at the, at the most, they thought that they had a $300 game. That is that is the origins of Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, I mean, at, at the time, and you know, what where they came up with that number, I think, you know, it cost 3000 to print. They thought a 10% return on investment was really what the value of the game, you know, could possibly be. I got and the feeling so, also because they were all kind of broke. Like none of these people had money. Arneson's living, you wrote in his parents' basement like we do. And uh, after college, Gary Gygax now has been fired from his job and he's he's struggling to make money. He's got five kids. These people, nobody's got money, John. Not two nickels to rub together. I mean, Gary, Gary started a, a shoe repair business out of his basement, right? Where he got a shoe repair shop. That was how he was supporting his family at the time that this idea 
came together between Arneson and Gygax that they could publish a game out of this weird set of fantasy rules, right? And this this is not what Avalon Hill was making money on, right? I mean, Avalon Hill was making money on, you're going to play through the Battle of the Bulge, you're going to play through Waterloo, you're going to play through, you know, all the Midway and all the Pacific Island battles. And there was definitely a market for that. Whether there was actually a market for this game where you're like a wizard, you go down into, you know, a dungeon, you kill monsters and get experience points, like th there really wasn't anything like it, right? And so to describe this as the market that was untested at the time, you know, that that too has a lot to do with the original evaluation of the game. And people at Avon Hill poo-pooed it, right? They all the fantasy elements of these games that they'd then been experimenting with since like 71, uh, D D came out then in 74. Avalon Hill was like, you know, this must seem foolish to work in childish, it's fairy tale stuff. This is like, is this for like preteen? kids that you're making this like what serious adult person where we do war games this is this is serious business we're investigating history through these conflict simulations and doing what ifs and counterfactuals to try and understand but is that a, but is that ultimately why the game succeeds does the game succeed because of the fact that they find this niche that nobody else is taking seriously and they're able to mine this 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 niche and everybody lets them get away with it because everybody thinks it's going to fail I mean, when we talk about succeeds, I mean, it, it, it achieved a very modest success thanks to that, right? And really that it became a mainstream phenomenon that any of us have heard of is based on other later historical accidents, right? When this, this kid was lost in the steam tunnel, supposedly in 1979, right. um, you know, that, that is the story that brought D&D &D to a real mainstream audience. Before that, it would have been a very small business still, like a million dollar a year business. Two then suddenly after that steam tunnel thing, it was on its way to being a $20 million a year business, you know, which no one could have anticipated back when they thought this was a $300 idea. It's also unbelievable that, you know, uh, uh, a lot of that stuff around that time was about Satanism and, and, and this craziness and Gary Gygax, deeply, deeply religious man. And, and Arneson as well. Yeah. Ar I mean, they took, oh. they took this quite seriously. Um, Arneson, he, he was part of this, uh, Bible study group called the way international. Um, you know, and he was very dedicated to that and Arneson, uh, or Gygax, of course, he was a Jehovah's witness, at least up until the point that they banned smoking. Um, he, he, he was a big smoker and, uh, there was a point there sometime around the early seventies when, the JW came down on the other side of that issue and he did kind of distance himself a bit at that point, but still strongly identified as a Christian. That is, that, that is kind of, uh, I don't know if it's ironic or what, but, 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 but when smoking comes before God, when you're like, well, that's, that's a bridge too far. Got to, but nicotine might be, might be slightly addictive when, when you get to that point. Um, uh, initially Dungeons and Dragons does not take off. It slowly does. You write as people, uh, uh, kind of play it like the rules are sparse and you really have to have somebody teach you. But as people teach you, the game is immersive and it's fun. I mean, I played it as a teenager. It was a blast. We would have so much fun dreaming up, up this stuff. We, when it when it finally hits its stride, uh, uh, w w what ultimately is the downfall of Gygax? Because a big part of this th this this book is really about. I mean, so far we've had struggle after struggle after struggle that you and I've talked about, and this is just the first fifty pages of the book, John. But 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 the struggle just continues all the way through your your book. They never are able to stop struggling. It seems like they're always pushing a rock uphill. What ultimately undoes uh, Gary Gygax and, and Dave Arneson? Yeah, it's, it's a, a complicated story. A lot of factors uh, went into that. I mean, you know, Gary certainly wants to start to make real money. I think something kind of clicked in his head. He changed a bit around like 1980 or 1981. And really, you know, he was very interested in Hollywood opportunities, very interested in kind of having a, a more of a California lifestyle. Um, much less interested in actually running the business that is CSR. I felt and, like as I was reading you, like he really grew an ego. I mean, and not in a good way, in a in a in kind of a bad way. Well, when you when you start, you know, making serious money, right? And like you you figure you must have done something, right? And uh, I think it's a that's a natural thing um, for people who are successful to maybe start thinking much better of themselves because of that. But I mean, you know, once once he started to distance himself from his business, his business partners, the Bloom family ended up really having to do a lot of the work. Um, and although Gygax was still like nominally in charge of the company TSR that published D&D, &D, you know, um, 
anything that the Bloom brothers did, Gary would second guess it, would say, you guys aren't doing it right, but I don't have the time to do this because I'm in California and I have a party I need to go to and I need to sit in the polo lounge and talk to film producers because we're going to do a D&D movie. Of course, they did do that D&D cartoon show, so it wasn't entirely right. um, you know, a, a joke, but he never managed to get the Hollywood stuff to work, right? He thought he was going to be working at like Orson Welles and, you know, doing big D&D movies and that never really materialized. And kind of, you know, his, his um, it, you know, I, I would even go as far as to say his contempt for the actual day-to-day -day running of a medium-sized business as opposed to a hobby, where it really is that one-on-one, -on -one, I'm interacting with you guys, I'm, we're going to design some rules and it's going to be really awesome. Once this became, okay, now we have 300 employees. Now, you know, we have to be concerned about all of their compensation and we need to be concerned about company cars. And he really just kind of checked out. Once he checked out, he left himself open, frankly, to other people taking over the company. I felt like it was his passion for the game that got him in. And, and as he's being separated from the games and it's no longer games and it just is, to your point, being CEO, I, I didn't, it, he didn't seem to have much love for being a CEO. He did not. Um, again, he, he spoke about it both publicly and privately. You know, he, he would even he even wrote a piece that was about kind of his his identity crisis of am I a game designer or, or am I an executive? Yeah. And, you know, you you can read this piece from 1981 as he kind of talks himself into, well, I should be an executive and I hope I don't regret it down the road. But he immediately regretted it. I mean, it re really wasn't what he wanted to do. Is that what you're referring to in your, you you have a quote right at the beginning of the book uh, uh, from Little Dorrit that says, no inventor can be a man of business, you know, is that. <laughs> Is it is that Gary Gygax? I think it's it's everyone who was involved. I mean, Arneson as well certainly did not have um, traditional business acumen or training, and yeah. you know he was very uh, wildly inventive, a very creative guy. Had a lot of trouble getting his ideas into a publishable form. He needed structures that would help him with that. But of course, he too thought you know, D and D successful. I'm going to start my own company. I'm going to compete. I'm going to do better. And, you know, it didn't, didn't go very well. <laughs> I mean, they, pretty much all the people who kind of came into this with the philosophy that because I'm good at gaming, I'll be good at business. Well, that worked for a while. It worked while this was still really a hobby. Once, once they started thinking, okay, we're going to be Milton Bradley, right? We're going to be Parker brothers. This is a company we're not going to be making 20 million. We're going to be making 280 million a year. Yeah, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, once they got that notion into their heads, uh, things rapidly went downhill. It is, it it is my understanding, and tell me if I have this wrong, that uh, TSR purchased, I think, by Wizards of the Coast, which which was purchased, I think, by Hasbro, who also picked up Avalon Hill, and All now true. now Avalon Hill and TSR still exist, but they're part of the same company. That, that is an irony that uh, many people have remarked on over the years because they, they were at loggerheads. They were fighting over who has the best convention, who has the best games. Is this hobby really going to be wargaming or is it going to be, you know, wizards and, you know, orcs and things like that? And I, um, I also felt like as I was reading you talking about this battle back and forth as TSR grows and they're fighting against Avalon Hill, which is a whole different thing people have to, 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 to read about. If you're and if you love business and you love the world of games, this is just a it, it is a great case study of that. But but I really felt like on Avalon Hill's end, John, when they decide to have a competing convention, it was actually more about survival than ego, even though Gary took it as. Gary took it as ego. I got the feeling reading you that, that, you know, Avalon Hill's not prospering. They're not doing great things. Or was it ego? Were they, were they trying to bash each other's head in? I mean, I think they were worried. They, they viewed the ascendancy of miniature games really as, as a threat. And, you know, they had, they used to back Gary Gygax's Gen Con. They were major sponsors of it. They would run conventions there, but, you know, they started going and being like, no one here is playing our games. Everybody's oh. playing these miniature games. And that guy over there, he's got like orcs and goblins and stuff like that. And it's like, that's not. And so they felt like they needed to have a venue that was going to yeah. be about their games. And that's, you know, I mean, Gary viewed that as a very existential threat. And this was a time, of course, when TSR was making, you know, $12,000 a year. Nothing, and Avalon right. Hill was making $1.5 million, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it wasn't, you know, like there was a serious competition between them as businesses yet. If anything, Avalon Hill was trying to just, you know, well, let's nip that at the butt. Before this yeah. gets any more serious, we'll we'll take over the convention thing, do our own thing. 
It's like I was having these discussions last week about why these big companies buy some of these little companies and then kill them right away. It's kind of, it's kind of, kind of that thing. You're like, you spent one and a half million dollars and you're just going to kill it. Yes. Uh, 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 Gary Gygax and uh, Dave Arneson both died early this century within a couple of years of each other. Uh, uh, were they still friends? Did they get along? Did they talk? They talked. Um, they had an uneasy detente. I'd say I wouldn't. I wouldn't say they were buds. They to some degree reconciled. And again, when when Wizards um, Wizards of the Coast purchased TSR, you know they they actually made sure to take care of both Gary and Dave a bit uh, when they did so, um, just to make sure there's no lingering lawsuits or intellectual property claims, or whatever. So I mean, you know, they that may have helped smooth things over as well. Um, just the things that that Wizards did at the time, but but you know they were still. Um, still arguing over who was really responsible for D&D, right? Who really thought this, who, whose brainchild really was it? And that that fight over legacy um, ultimately ended up to be much more enduring than the fights over the money. Now you can't take the money with you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The book is called Game Wizards. The epic battle for Dungeons and Dragons is, I'm sure everybody can tell, I've, I super enjoyed it. Is, is there, and, and I'm imagining it's available everywhere, John? Ah, uh, yes. The uh, uh, my last question is you clearly have so much research that went into this project, like your projects in the past. Was there anything as you were digging that really surprised you that that you went, wow, didn't see that coming like plot twist? You know, I, I certainly was surprised that um, Dave Arneson was making as much money before they settled the lawsuit as he was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think the traditional story of, you know, that TSR cheated Arneson, uh, they, they didn't pay him anything for D&D after a certain point, right? Like after 1977, once the advanced Dungeons and Dragons game started coming out, Arneson was basically getting nothing. And like even right before the settlement in 1980, so after the steam tunnel kit, it suddenly made D&D popular. Like Arneson's take was maybe a third, a little less than a third of Gygax's, but that was still at the time, like $130,000 a year, which today would be more like, you know, 450 right, right in today right. money. Like, so it wasn't like the guy was living in a garret. Um, for <laughs> that was a bit of a plot twist for, for me in the research, because I mean, it. I think it really is important to look realistically at what, you know, how much people benefited from this. You know, who, who are the heroes and who are the martyrs? To me, nobody was, right? This was a complicated, unprecedented situation um, where people were doing the best they could in a market that nobody understood and nobody knew why it was popular and you know uh, everybody just wanted to hold on to as much of it as they could